Years back, I was reading a Miss Manners column. A woman was writing in that she had a son in kindergarten, and it was in a very upscale school. And as Christmas time came, she and the son went out and they bought a present for her, the son's teacher. Came back and they cut out some construction paper, and she helped her son make a little card to go along with the present. And the day came when all the kids were supposed to take presents to their teacher, and that afternoon he came back in tears. All the other little kindergarten kids had engraved cards with their presents. And the son was really upset because all he had was his little handmade card. And so the woman asked Miss Manners for advice. Miss Manners' comment was, your son is traveling in a bad crowd. Kindergarten kids have engraved cards already. Something's wrong. And you think about our educational system, and it's not so much the educational system, it's our society it has really strange values. I was reading recently when people working on Wall Street think they're the smartest people in the world. And the hedge fund people think that the peons on Wall Street are just that, just slaves, wage slaves. They're the smartest ones. It's a very warped idea of what it means to be intelligent. It's all very short-sighted, thinking that intelligence is a sign of putting in as little work as possible and squeezing the most out of other people as you can. It may be smart in the short term, but it's really dumb in the long term. As the Buddha said, you've got to take the long view. if you want to be wise, if you want to be happy. The question that he said lies at the beginning of wisdom is, one, you go to a contemplative, someone who's found the end of suffering, knows something about the deathless. In other words, you go to the right people. And then you ask this question, what will I do will be to my long-term welfare and happiness? What is blameless? What is skillful? And then on the other side, what will I do will be to my long-term harm and suffering, what is blameworthy, what is unskillful. These are the questions that you ask, and you have to choose the right people, people who do take the long view, the really long view. But notice those questions, what, when I do it, to lead, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. There's an I and there's a my in there. Sometimes we think the Buddha taught that there is no self, but he classed the idea that there is no self as a form of wrong view, just as he classed the idea that there is a self as a form of wrong view. He did note, however, that we have a process called eye-making and mind-making. If you read the text, that's one of the things that an arahant goes beyond. And a lot of us would like to take the, the cheater's route. Well, let's just clone that idea by saying there is no self, and I'll live with that assumption. But you can't do that. In that case, the eye-making and the eye-making go underground where you can't find them. So you bring them up to the surface. The eye here is the agent or the producer, the my here, and my long-term welfare and happiness. That's the person who's going to be receiving the results of this these actions. Now, some actions give immediate results, and they're very easy to, to judge. You spit in the wind, and it comes right back as you learn not to spit in the wind. You stick your hand into a fire, it burns immediately. But there are other things that are unpleasant to do right now, but they're going to give long-term happiness. There are things that are unpleasant to do, excuse me, things that are pleasant to do now that are going to lead to long-term suffering things that are unpleasant to do that are going to lead to long-term welfare and happiness. And you've got to learn how to deal with those things. You have to learn how to have a good, strong, healthy sense of self in order to maintain that. You see this in modern psychology. They talk about what's called anticipation and sublimation. Anticipation means you see that there's harm down the line that you've got to prepare for. And it really does matter that it's 
harm is going to come down the line. If you didn't care about what happened to you five days from now or five years from now, there'd be no reason to do anything skillful right now. You'd just do whatever you enjoy right now, and that would be it. And then there's sublimation, when you realize, okay, there are certain pleasures that you have to forego right now for the sake of a larger pleasure down the line. These are aspects of a healthy sense of self. And the Buddha advises that we do this. We have these attitudes. Again, you hear about when you hit the end of the path, there's no sense of I or mine, no sense of conceit. Everything is all put aside. Well, both self and not self are put aside at that point. But it's because there's no need for these concepts anymore. In the meantime, you do need them. Anticipation he calls heedfulness, realizing that if you don't get your act together now, there's going to be trouble down the line. And as we said the other day, he augments that with a sense of shame, a healthy sense of shame. I remember talking to a psychologist a while back who was surprised that there could be some, such a thing as a healthy sense of shame. But that's scary. Psychologists spend their time putting their opinions into people's ears and people's heads. And if they think that shame is always unhealthy, then we have a shameless society. You have to realize your actions do have consequences, and you do have a choice. This teaching is so important that it's one of the few issues where the Buddha would actually go out and argue with other people. When he heard that someone was teaching that either your actions have no impact at all, there's no sense of causality leading from one moment to the next, or that you don't have any choices. In other words, the doctrine of determinism. He'd actually go and argue with people who believe these things and point out that the idea of doing anything at all, teaching anything at all, taking on a practice of any kind at all, would make no sense with either of those ideas, because they close off the path. So there is freedom of choice, and the actions do have consequences. And so you try to develop the sen healthy sense of I who's making the choices and the healthy sense of I who's going to be receiving the results. And then it talks about the healthy sense of the producer or the, the agent. He says, we practice to overcome conceit, but there's a need for conceit on the path, a conceit that says this, other people can gain awakening, they're human beings, I'm a human being, why can't I gain awakening too? That's an attitude you want to develop. And the Buddha talks about the healthy sense of self as the receiver of the results of your actions. He says, when you see that you're feeling tempted to wander off the path, you have to ask yourself, do I really want to go back to where I was before? Would I really be caring for myself? What kind of happiness would I be creating for myself? And it's all pretty miserable. So one of the signs of wisdom certainly is not how you can take advantage of other people or how you can get to squeeze the most money out of the system. Wisdom is learning how to take the long view and find ways of encouraging yourself to stick with things, stick with the path, even when it gets difficult. John Mahabua talks about how you know, the path to the supreme happiness is going to involve some suffering, because after all, your defilements don't want you to be on the path. And it's an important thing that you learn how not to identify with them. It's so easy when greed or laziness whisper in your ears. It's so easy when anger whispers in the ears, whispers in your heart, for you to identify with a voice and say, oh yes, this is what I really believe. But where do those attitudes take you? 
Where has greed got in the world? Where has anger got in the world? Why do we like these things so much? Why do I, we identify with them? They give a cheap satisfaction in the, in the media of a moment, but that's it. There's a lot of suffering that they bring in their, in their wake. And so it's this ability to look down the corridors of time, take the long view. Okay, There are things that are difficult to do, but they're going to bring happiness. And you've got to learn how to use your ingenuity to be able to talk yourself into doing them. You can't have the teacher sitting there holding your hand all the time. And the same things that you like to do now, but you know they're going to lead to suffering down the line. You have to learn how to talk yourself out of them, not to kill off the voices that remind you that they have their consequences. And for all too long, the ingenuity has been on the side of the defilements. You've got to learn how to bring your ingenuity around the other side. On the side of healthy I making and my making. That's our only hope for anything, any happiness of real substance. 